What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again. And this time we are here with Morian of the Almighty Alkaloid. Thank you so much for being here. It is great to have you here. An absolute pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, anytime, man. It's so awesome to have you here. Your new album, Newman, I cannot wait for the rest of the world to hear this. Did you just consider this like a follow-up or like a continuation of what we heard off of Liquid Anatomy? Or was this meant to almost kind of be like a new beginning for Alkaloid in a way? Uh, no, we do see it as a continuation. Uh, in general terms, of course, um, since it's a, well, let me, let me put it like this. The, the, the soul of the band is the songwriting. So everybody in the band writes uh, as well and contributes artistically. So um, our premise that we s formed the band for was that um, each of us gets to write whatever they want. <laughs> so that aspect is a little bit predictable between albums because when one album is finished, we don't really know yet what we're gonna do on the next one. And because we, we give ourselves the biggest possible artistic freedom, uh, it's a surprise to us as well what comes out. But in general, you know, we've we've all been around the block enough times to know what we want more or less. So we are more or less settled in what we want to do and we, what we want to say. So in that sense, every next album is definitely a continuation of what went before. But of course, you try to develop at the same time. And I took this um, uh, as the lyricist of the band, or the, the main lyricist, let's say, and because I'm in charge of the concepts also and stuff, um, I actually started seeing a chance after the first album, where I started a couple of, let's say, narrative threads for certain songs to continue those threads on the next album. So I did this on Liquid Anatomy, and I did this again uh, on the new album. Uh, allowing me to bring all those different strands together slowly into the same world, which I find very exciting because it gives you a feeling of uh, cohesiveness of what you are creating. It starts to feel more and more like there is one sort of alkaloid universe that we are building. And it's a complex universe with many different layers and many different sides and aspects and styles and ideas. It will always be open to fresh ideas, but in general, it does feel like we are, if anything, solidifying what we've always been trying to do. And this album is uh, absolutely also a, a testimony to that. Okay. Well, I feel like, you know, and, and I know that some artists are skeptical on using this term, but I consider Alkaloid's music to be a very experimental, if you will, because of your way you incorporate these many different elements and you fluctuate in structures. Like, it's fair to say Clusterfuck is not a representation of what this whole album is going to sound like in a way. <laughs> no, because I, I take it you've heard the whole album. I didn't want to spoil it for the listeners, but yes, and uh, it's. I, I'll just well, say right now, it's the best Alkaloid album to date. Like uh, you, thank you. But um, I wanted to ask if maybe with your experimental sound, that makes it kind of easier or allows for more flexibility to sort of try new things and bring in different elements. Oh, absolutely, and it's really, it's because we don't ever want to give up this artistic freedom that we're giving ourselves because it would have made no sense to start a new band based around a bunch of composers uh, if at the same time we would, um, let's say, cage ourselves in a corset that is, um, I don't know, it doesn't matter if it's tag death or whatever or frog rock or what. I mean, we have to use terms to describe our music, but uh, it always remains open and it's purely determined by our tastes and what we want to say at the time. And then poor Hannes has to make sense of it all as <laughs> the engineer, but he is managing uh, incredibly, really. So yeah, I consider myself very, very lucky to um, to get to do this with these awesome guys. Um, and does it ever start off with a preconceived vision anyway? Do you go into the songwriting knowing what you want the concept to be or knowing how you want it to sound in a way? Or is it a very improvisational process and you kind of let things sort of fall into place? Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, and I tend to go into the songwriting for a new album, like for my own songs, knowing very well what I want to do because um, like, for example, the Dyson Sphere saga, um, it's something that is always on <clears throat> in my head. So the years in between albums, I spend these years already thinking of the next chapters and already researching and reading a lot. And uh, yeah, create, it takes a long time to create the worlds that then I have to condense in 
I need little songs. <laughs> so, so that takes a long time. So I, and I enjoy this part. I love this part about this band that I, that I know I can, I can build on what I did before. So uh, let's say for me personally, the songwriting for Alkaloid is an ongoing process that is like on some level is always there. And only when it becomes concrete that you have to write the actual songs and notes. Um, do I start committing it to paper, so to speak? But um, I, I always want to know <clears throat> what I'm actually going to say because otherwise, in this, in, in, in the complexity that we're handling, I would get lost like immediately. But I cannot say how that is for my colleagues because, for example, with Hannes, um, what I notice about his songs, and it will become even clearer now on the new album, is that um, even though he still incorporates like crazy virtuosic death metal things and and let's say things that have made his name in the past i also noticed that he's giving more and more time for his ideas he's embracing more and more the let's say the rock aspect and occasionally there's even a riff with eight notes that doesn't take you to the absolute limit of what you can play so mm. this is an interesting development in this band and we know that um we are not betraying our, let's say, our style because at the same time, we know we can always count on enough crazy, fast, brutal, and insane things to, to get thrown into the mix because Hannes also likes those things, obviously. But we do see a little bit of a shift, let's say, uh, away from, the, from, from this tech death uh, niche that we have been born from let's say more yeah. or less because i mean people knew obscura and necrophagist and non-euclid whatever but of course we are trying to become more and more our own thing and ideally um, at some point the world would see us uh, as a genre of our own we might still be a couple of albums away from really having that status because you can still clearly tell like okay there's a lot of morbid angel influence here and this part sounds like yes and this sounds like this and that i mean without ever copying something but you know what i mean yeah so, absolutely it's it's we i do look at the at the really big kind of arc of uh of a band's evolution and i can see it going on like decades into the future yeah. because there will never be a lack of ideas or things we want to try out or limits we haven't quite uh arrived at yet well i was gonna ask actually because obviously you know with with the formation i mean i'll just say that uh, all of you guys every member of alcoholoid has the biggest uh, metal archives resume i've ever seen but like uh <laughs> yeah which i'm relieved i'm speaking to you because i think you were maybe in the least amount so i don't have to mention reference every single freaking band i usually like to reference every band and yours is the easiest i think with hans like i'll name all the bands and like 20 minutes will go by and i'm still naming bands but uh but, yes. um, but one thing i wanted to, that i found a, a commonality with is that because you know obscura is a very concept driven band too and you know hans was on omnivium and cosmogenesis uh and mm -hmm. you coming from dark fortress i know that specter of the old world has like a lot of uh conceptual uh meaning behind it as well so did maybe yeah. did, did maybe every member coming from a metal band that's very thought-provoking and very conceptually driven maybe lay some common ground and mutual understanding of each other on how to create music together because when you make a concept album i think it's like a very very it's like almost a completely different songwriting approach than you know just getting into the studio or the practice space and jamming you know uh oh yeah absolutely um and I gotta say, this is somewhat involuntary in our case because with every album, I, I know I always have the hope that for once we could get together and actually work out our ideas together. Um, because I mean, with musicians like that, that's uh, you know, it's an it's an absolute privilege. And of course, Hannes is gonna have better ideas what new things he can do with his drums than I can have. But unfortunately, um, this time it didn't happen again because of the pandemic, because we couldn't actually get together. So it was once again, you know, everybody in their little alcove writing their things and then maybe exchanging a demo here and there. But basically everybody just wrote their stuff and then we recorded it. And um, also we didn't all of us meet until the, the photo session beginning of this year. You know, this is how, this is how it goes simply because of the logistics but um so in in that sense yes we do uh, write uh, separately as i said everybody can do <clears throat> whatever they want to do in principle because we know that we share 
a rather broad common base in what we like and what we have done. And um, the fact that each of us has done so many different things in the past, like been part of so many bands and like has done the different styles within extreme metal for so many years, um, it, it actually gives us a certain relaxedness that you don't have to prove yourself anymore with every single song that you write how fast you can make it or how brutal or how whatever and, and i have to say getting older as a composer it's um it's a real advantage because you are not so much stuck anymore in what you expect of yourself so in, in general you can just let go of expectations to yourself to your bandmates to the outside world in general and just you know go for whatever interests you in that moment and and yeah, miraculously, somehow this has always worked very nicely in this band, even though, as I said, when we go into the songwriting for an album, like we have no clue. <laughs> I mean, I, I know what I want to write, but also when I've made the songs, they do surprise me as well. And I think this is really important as a, as a you know, as a creative mind that you retain the ability to keep surprising yourself with what you're doing, because honestly, if, if if we were doomed to just repeat something that was hugely successful in the past, I think we would die uh, artistically, you know, or, or, or creatively. I mean, there are people that can do this very well. There are bands that have consistently developed their thing over decades, like Mishuga or Cannibal Corpse, and I love these bands. I, I adore them. I'm on my knees for them, but I'm a different kind of mind, and I think this goes for all of us as well. Definitely. I mean, every artist is their own. I mean, ACDC has been able to make the similar album their whole career and it works yeah. for them so but then there's bands like i feel like with the sort of technical and progressive style that i think the foundation of alkaloids in sticking with the same thing like i just saw um last night uh i just saw dream theater devin townsend and animals as leaders play and like you <laughs> no, could what a billy oh, you have no <laughs> idea and the beautiful thing is i would you could be a half hour late and make it before the first song ends at that show it's beautiful but like but, but <laughs> yeah. um but they were uh, an, an amazing set but like you could tell like when they're playing songs like on the set list that they're playing songs from the same album and then when they and then when they go to a different portion of their discography because every album in a progressive metal catalog plays by its own rules and mm -hmm. going Going to the concept, though, of Alkaloid, do you think of a concept before you put pen to paper on writing and anything? Or do you maybe need to kind of like experiment with some riffs and experiments with some patterns in order to get a full idea of a concept? Uh, no, I, I tend to um, also know the, the concept, more or less, what I want to write about. I mean, not in detail. It's not like I sat down 10 years ago and decided what we, we would do for the next decade. Um, because that would counteract the, the, the freedom that we want to give ourselves. But mm, for some reason, I, I can't explain why, I knew the, <laughs> which title I would like to give the first three albums before the first album came out. I knew that, and, and it's just words that came to my mind that, you know, resonated. And I thought, okay, Liquid Anatomy, okay, I have immediately some vague idea what that can be about. And then, I stumbled across the word Newman also 10 years ago, and I thought, oh, I, that's a good album title. And then I wait for years until ideas sort of grow out of that tiny little bit of inspiration until our full world has grown out of them. And of course, along the way, I keep collecting ideas and I'm, I'm always writing. I'm a, I'm a composer in daily life, so I have to be creative every day. So I have a huge kind of storage um, compartment in my head for like ideas that come so that when the time comes i can already draw from from things that i knew okay I, one day i would like to in this case for example i, I became a, a a very passionate amateur gardener <laughs> during the pandemic and all of a sudden i was super interested in in, in biology and how plants grow and everything and like doing these things in, in our house here um i got fascinated by what goes on underground. So I started reading about mushrooms, about mycelium, and finding so many things that fit perfectly to alkaloid that when it came to write Newman, I was like, okay, so does this fit in there? And then I twist my head until <laughs> until it fits, and then I uh, I can write my my songs. But it's a, it's all a very organic uh, process that I would 
um, compare more with yeah with a, you know like a, a biotope that grows over time it surprises you what comes out and some things work other things don't but it feels much more like that than that we go and decide okay now is the time to have ideas that, that that's how it works for me but i i have no idea where the other guys take their inspirations from and how it works for them i would have to ask them but this is how it is for me well uh because you led me perfectly into the next question uh, which you've been really good at i love it um but like because <laughs> of the, your con conceptual driven nature like on the first album having you know like those five songs like the dyson sphere series or something mm -hmm. like and you know when you open up with carbon phrases like i feel like the beginning of alkaloid i mean it's objectively the beginning when you open up with carbon phrases all the way to newman now with the current album do, does your personal life or your personal emotions or your personal experience maybe influence the concept at all as well or has music always been more of an escapism from your personal life where you kind of don't want to bring in your own experience and you almost kind of want to portray something else or maybe inform the listener on a external subject matter um, I would say very clearly the latter, <clears throat> because as an artist, you can either um, comment on our reality, <clears throat> which in, in, in satire or cabaret or, 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 I don't know, a band like Rage Against the Machine, they derive their content from what goes on around them in reality, which is a, a perfectly legitimate um, basis for, you know, for your art. <clears throat> but the other path you can take is to try and get away from this reality as <clears throat> as far as you can and I've always been an escapist in that sense um, and I think it goes also for my colleagues I, I can say like for with, with Chris Münzner I know for sure and uh, I know Hannes is also fascinated by all kinds of things that are not necessarily connected to his let's say human existence and again as a, as a lyricist I uh, I always felt that uh, there are so many people who are better at turning their personal human emotions into art that people love that I, I always felt I'm better at actually creating worlds or, or what, what I, what I feel I want to give to the audience is a glimpse into the worlds in my mind and, and the worlds in my mind that fascinate me the most. Uh, and somehow i've ended up um getting inspired mainly by the you know by the extremes of of different science disciplines or the ideas that are out there uh, in this world uh <clears throat> trying to explain this unbelievable mystery that we are all in <laughs> the, the, the miracle that anything exists at all let alone how it exists how big it is and stuff this is what inspires me now and this is just something that developed like this because you know after spending decades always um drawing inspiration from from my imagination uh i now find that if you look at reality in uh in a specific way meaning like discovering the the, the mystical layers of reality which in daily life we have no time to to pay any attention to um I'm finding so many overwhelmingly fascinating things that my human personal emotions and frustrations that I have as a person just really pale in comparison to me in terms of how inspiring I find them. So I've made this decision years ago. I mean, it wasn't really a decision, but I just felt like, okay, I, I don't necessarily have to write songs about my problems or about my, you know, because I don't think I'm that interesting compared to the world. <laughs> you know? Well, so well, and that and that that helps the escapism part, of course, because yeah. we are we are uh, focusing attention away from us as persons and more towards what we find interesting. Well, um, you know, to quote Henry Matisse, though, every painting is a self-portrait in in that regard. So it is coming from you know, you in a way, but does, is it fair to say that when you, when we listen to the Alkaloid catalog versus, you know, an album such as The Crawling Chaos or, you know, stuff from uh, Dark Fortress with Venereal Dawn or, um, or Edolin or Spectres from the Old World, that maybe you have a different attachment to it or you're channeling a different energy or expressing maybe a different side of yourself uh, because uh, there's different subject matter and a different process with it? Yeah, uh, definitely. And this has to do with, um, 
what each of these bands is or was about. Um, because, I mean, I'm still the same person writing lyrics for Dark Fortress, for Alkaloid, and for whatever else. But I found that in black metal, so in the case of Dark Fortress, um, you do need a human perspective always because, let's say, it's as a genre, it's in, in a narrative sense, it, it's less abstract than death metal can be. Death metal doesn't have to anchor the listener um, to the human perspective in a way. Death metal can be about anything and it can still work. With black metal, you always need to, um, you need to relate to a person that is going through a certain things. So what I did in Dark Fortress on the last album, for example, is um, the, the world that the, the, the lyrics and songs are taking place in is just as abstract and remote from our reality as, as for my alkaloid lyrics. But um, in order to connect to the emotions that I feel in the songs when I get them, I get the songs in an instrumental way, and then I, you know, I do my stuff with what usually Vicentura has written. I had to put my like a human perspective in there of, and in this case, it was of somebody that gets sucked out of the universe into the extra dimensions that string theory uh, proposes. So, in a way, somebody gets sucked out of the universe and then looks at the universe. So, what does that do with you as a person if you go through such a such an indescribable experience, um, what you feel when this happens to you was very important uh, for the Dark Fortress lyrics. So there is more of a human perspective there. That same world could be portrayed in an, uh, on an Alkaloid album. So there's no difference in the inspiration. But um, in Alkaloid, I pretty much took out the human perspective altogether in the beginning because I wanted also to tell stories on a much bigger scale and much bigger sort of cosmic timeline or evolutionary timeline um, where it wouldn't make any sense to tell it from the perspective of a human that lives for 80 years and then is gone. You know, it's, it's, I, I, I truly feel in the big picture we are super irre irrelevant. <laughs> um, so it's this big picture that interests me and that's why I'm, I, I, yeah, I love that with Alkaloid I can just do this. I mean, n n nobody uh, like not, none of my bandmates ever said like, hey, listen, this lyric is a bit too far out or something. Else. <laughs> They're just happy that somebody writes lyrics that hopefully work yeah. so I can do whatever the hell I want. And it's, uh, it's, it's genius. But yeah, it's this difference in perspective. Like Alkaloid doesn't need a human perspective. Dark Fortress did need it. Do you almost look for inspiration? Is inspiration something that can be sought out, especially with concepts? Is there maybe like a lot of research involved? Are you looking at other, you know, artistic mediums such as film or visual art or literature as a means? Or is it all like uh, coming from within? Is there almost just kind of like you let the inspiration strike you versus you go seeking it out? Well, uh, it's both, I have to say, because as I said, I, I'm... I need to be creative pretty much every day because of also my other work. So I'm writing all the time. So I need to make sure that I have a constant stream of inspiration because yeah, otherwise it's very hard to create something. So this is something that is just, you know, part of my daily life and has been for, for decades that I'm always looking for something that fascinates me or my mind always needs something that it can chew on and that it, it can, yeah, that it can embrace and get lost in. And um, uh, in that sense, my, my music and my lyrics are just always, let's say, different, like, if, if, if this continuous search for inspiration is the mycelium that is underground, uh, then here and there, you know, different mushrooms crop up as an extension of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> of that inspiration. And well, it can be different mushrooms. Uh, sometimes it's for a string quartet, and then it's for a film soundtrack, and then it's for a death metal band and so forth. But I have managed to sort of unify this inspiration in myself, that really the question which medium I use in order to express what I want to say is sort of a detail. It, and and I like this, I can always write my music. It, and, and I'm independent or sort of independent of what I have to write for. Because as a composer, you can, um, you can choose what you say, but usually 
people will tell you like, okay, write a piece for a string orchestra or for this or for that. So you are, <clears throat> you have to make your ideas work in whatever framework you are given. And with Alkaloid, of course, we created our own framework, but nevertheless, it is a framework. It is a framework of a metal band. So with Alkaloid, I have to translate and filter my ideas in a way that it works for a five piece metal band. If I'm busy with a classical piece, I have to filter it in a different way, but the idea can actually be the same. And this developed because in the beginning when I was composing, I was still also studying at the, at the conservatory here, and I tried to be more Catholic than the Pope in the sense that as somebody without a classical background, studying classical composition, I felt like, okay, I have to be extra classical. But at the same time, I was a flamenco guitarist, I was a metalhead, and I tried to keep these worlds sort of separate in my mind, but that drove me crazy in the, lo in the long run because I couldn't, it's like splitting your soul into different parts. No, you are the same person. So when, when this penny dropped finally that I just write my music and well, today it's for this and tomorrow it's for that and people may not see the connection, but I feel the connection very clearly. That really liberated me to not worry about genres or stuff. Fair enough. Fair enough. And the final <laughs> question I wanted to ask uh, pertaining to the concept and pretty much the last question I have is because, you know, in the end, all art is very much open to interpretation and, you know, we all have our own individual experiences with it. And, you know, I hope we could experience this live eventually. But like, um, do you feel that when people interpret it or even just when the song is out there more and lingering in the world more that maybe the context sort of evolves a little bit and that maybe its meaning develops and maybe it has new uh new meaning behind it as more and more people make it their own um but, but what is the question exactly Did, could uh, the context of the material or could the meaning of the material evolve as more and more people experience it and more people you mean in you mean independently of what yeah. the composer initially had in mind yeah yeah of course um this is kind of hard to accept in the beginning when you're writing because you want to share what you have to say but if you look at yourself as a listener i don't like anybody telling me what i'm supposed to feel about something that i see or hear so we always make art our own and and honestly um, if art is trying to hammer home a message that has nothing to do with art you know like if, if, if you try to harness art to, to transport the political message or whatever. I always think you, you, you sort of hurt the art itself. So we as, as creators, we have to accept that once you deliver the, the master of the album, it's going to be out there and it belongs to the public from that moment on. Um, so of course it's, it can be very amusing or sometimes also frustrating if you know your song is on youtube the lyrics are out there interviews are out there anybody who takes five minutes could easily find out at least what it's about or what what is more or less the the, the subject of a song <laughs> but people don't always do that and they have all rights to do that you know if you wanna uh if you wanna see the resurrection of jesus in our songs well, that's for sure not in there from us. We didn't put that in there. But if that's what you want to see, well, that is your business. And we have to really accept that. Um, I see that more in Dark Fortress. I think that's more about Jesus and stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, there have been hilarious moments when, you know, some 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 basement warrior is telling everybody what your song is actually about. And you're like, yeah, not at all, man. You didn't even... You didn't even Google the lyrics, let alone read them, and you made zero efforts to find out what it's actually about. But that's okay, because we gave this song to the world. Now it's yours, and you can do with it whatever you want. You can hate it, you can love it, you can, as I said, you can see whatever it is you want to see in it, because it's no longer ours. And what really helps is that, well, I finish something, I deliver it, and the <coughs> next day I have to start with the next thing. So I have, I had to learn to let it go. Um, and I have no problem with that, but it did take a while to also let go of the need to explain yourself or to, 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 to correct people because yeah, there is no more correcting. Yeah. I cannot correct what you feel about something yeah. and, and, and I shouldn't. So I should just shut up, give it to yeah. you and accept whatever you make. of it. And it's frustrating too, because like, you're right. Like 
um, when I went to art school, you know, you almost like learning how to you ha you almost have to learn how to explain your art. You have to learn how to defend it, address the concept, how to analyze it from a from a formalistic standpoint, uh, objectively and subjectively. Like there's all this art that you have to learn just about um, just uh, speaking about your work. So uh, like, and then you know, but in the end, you put it in a gallery, or in your case, you know, you put it online for people to experience. Like everybody's gonna have their own interpretation of it, regardless. So it's like, man, I learned how to explain all this shit for nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, um, when I studied composition, this was um, this was a huge subject. Also, I mean, we we really learned to defend ourselves. Like a anything that after I graduated, let's say if you if you get a a review in a newspaper about your premiere or whatever, and somebody just tries to rip you a new one, you know, somebody is really tries to burn you down. I felt very well prepared because no cri no criticism could be nearly as bad as what we went through in school because we were really like one one guy would have to speak about his piece and everybody else was just there like a bunch of you know wild hyenas trying to tear it apart and point out the flaws in your uh in your defense <laughs> of, your, of your music which was fun but it was also really uh yeah it was pretty confronting and frustrating sometimes especially when you're young and stupid, insecure about yourself these days I sort of lament that that doesn't happen so much anymore because very few people seem to have the time to go so deeply into your stuff that they, you know, that they analyze it properly or that, that, that the right questions um, come to the surface because I would love to sit with somebody, even somebody who really cannot stand uh, what we do and finds it totally stupid. I would love to sit like in the old days in college um to defend what we are doing because there's a lot to talk about and you know i mean we put so much into our music and into everything around it that's what we do it for right so you know there is a reason for every note and for every word and for every transition or whatever there's a lot behind it and i would l i would love to have more of a platform to speak about these things to speak about all the details and what's actually behind it because i think it can also help uh open up a song to somebody who is really interested and i know that you know maybe not all our fans but we have a lot of fans that are musicians themselves that write stuff themselves like people like us basically and those people are then really interested in in let's say in the in the details as well and in, 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 in what is behind all our ideas so i i would love more chances to actually discuss these things and not just like um yeah are you gonna tour and um, what technique do you use for that solo or something you know it's, that's why it's, I, um, that's why i got this channel <laughs> man um do uh do knock on our door because i'm always ready to um to take a plunge oh you <laughs> and you I, I you and i need to start a podcast together i think we're gonna go deep. lovely we, we pick a different concept album and we just analyze and interpret the ever-loving crap out of it and It'll lead into some discussions that uh, will make some metalheads uh, have pyrotechnics coming out of their ears. <laughs> yeah. I would love that, and I say this, I say this sincerely. So yeah. do hit me up when you when you have a plan or an idea, because yeah, I I, I really like this, and I'm sure we can yeah. we, we will not run out of stuff to talk about. De definitely. <laughs> So before we go, I want to a thank you so much for your time for such an awesome conversation to start the day off with. Just um, uh, with with the release of Newman, is there anything else we could be expecting in terms of live shows? Especially also because this year does mark ten years of Alkaloid as well. So like, can we maybe be getting a celebration? Maybe you could finally uh, get on a U.S. tour one day. Well, we want to do this very badly because we we haven't played nearly as much as we would like to we did play a couple of awesome festivals and stuff and we are all you know live musicians as well it's not you know it's you would expect that that happens automatically so this time around we really want to um want to make work of of, of getting out uh, on the stages of the world and um, hopefully try and play to everybody that wants to hear us so um, we are working on this right now. So at, in the background, we are very, very busy. We are contacting festivals, we're looking for bookers. We are even, I'm, I'm 
um, these days uh, working with the, the Bach Festival Dordrecht, it's a little town close to Rotterdam, who asked me to come up with a program, a concert program combining Bach and metal. And I want to do this with Alkaloid, obviously. So this is something that's in the works. We don't know yet if we're going to get the money to, to do it, but we are working on this. So Make that ideally, freaking happen. Uh, so you, <laughs> you're gardening right now. Sell whatever shrooms or pot you need to do to to make that <laughs> symphony happen yeah. oh we are, we are definitely trying because yeah it's been it's been really frustrating to to uh to to have so many setback setbacks trying to establish ourselves as a live band because well first okay the first years were difficult because nobody had time everybody had too many things to do then this with the second album uh all of a sudden we we sort of lost danny i mean now it's official but you know he went through some, you know, a really difficult time that had nothing to do with us. But, you know, when the album was just out and we were ready to sort of, you know, say, okay, let's look for concerts and stuff. Well, there was this problem all of a sudden. Like, okay, let's wait what happens. You know, let's give Danny some time. And then at the end, well, it became obvious that, um, that he couldn't go on. And then now, of course, the pandemic came again. Uh, and, and, these are all excuses that aren't good for anything, but I just want to say like, yeah, we wanted to play more live also in the past, and now we need to make it happen. So uh, we hope that um, in maybe after the summer we can announce more concrete things, but in the background, we are really, really busy trying to get ourselves out there. So if, if, uh, if anybody, let's say on the US side, for example, is willing to go through the, kafkaesque nightmare of bringing a european band to the states to play because this it was bad before but now it's like kind of impossible oh i'm gonna text if all my booking go friends that, i'm gonna text all my booking friends right now please do because we would we would really love it of course and i i haven't toured the states we played two festivals uh, last year with with dark fortress which were my first u.s shows ever and the shows were great and i mean evan and his his entire Beam from the death fests. I mean, he was the first guy in 15 years of trying that actually <laughs> was willing to go through this bizarre tunnel of hell to get us over there because it's a lot of money. It's two years of, of, of bureaucratic insanities that you have to face. It's like you, you want to immigrate into the United States with your you know, family of 10 for 10 years just to get to play one show that you get kind of nothing for, you know, it's, it's, it's really bizarre. But if somebody is willing to go through that and can offer us at least acceptable basic conditions, you know, we don't, we, we're not expecting anything, you know, outrageous to play, but, you know, we, we cannot afford to pay thousands from our own private pockets just to, you know, play in front of paying audiences uh, <laughs> that we don't earn anything with. If you know people that are that are willing to 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 try this with us, we are definitely open, and we would love nothing more than to to meet our fans properly over there. We'll smuggle. Because I know you we in have here. many fans. We'll smuggle please, you in here. Do. We, we <laughs> have to get 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 in your one of your road cases, like you know, have the guitars, the amps, and all that. But then the members are in another road case, and then uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like theoretically, theoretically, the members <laughs> are gear, so you know, we'll just say uh, it's cargo. It's, it's it's a new it's a new it's a new piece of gear. It looks and sounds like a human. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think well, let's see let's see what is possible and also how the world develops, uh, because we do still feel also the the aftermath of the pandemic because it's it. It, I mean, the pandemic may be over in a, in a health and social sense, but it's still really, really difficult to plan tours in an extreme genre like we are in, you know, it's, it's, and it will need years to recover if it recovers at all. So it's, it's difficult times, but I, I'm staying positive because man, we are back and I want to get out there. <laughs> and we want you here, but uh, thank you so much, everybody. We are here with Alkaloid. Be sure to check out Newman coming out very soon on Season of Mist this September. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Awesome.